So I'll, I'll move on now then to introducing um, Gurminder Bambra, who is a who is the professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex, and was recently elected a fellow of the British Academy. She's the author of Connected Sociologies that came out in 2014 and the award-winning Rethinking Modernity, Post-Colonialism and the Sociological Imagination, which came out in 2007. She's also the co-editor of Decolonizing the University that came out just in 2018 and has spoken regularly on the crisis for refugees in Europe and on questions of citizenship in the light of Brexit. She set up the Global Social Theory website and is the co-editor of the social research magazine, Discover Society. Um, the title of her talk, as you'll know, is the colonial context of national welfare from imperial amnesia to white replacement. So she's going to speak roughly for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have a, a discussion after that. So I'm going to um, take the video off myself, unvideo myself, if that's the expression, um, but I'll keep an eye on, on the chat column in case someone has an important communication to make or just an observation they want to share. So thank you very much for joining us today, Gurminda, and over to you. Okay, so thanks so much uh, for the invitation to come and speak here today. I have produced some slides because in a way I was asked to do that because apparently just sort of looking at a person talking for quite a long time can be a bit difficult. So hopefully the slides can entertain you uh, through the course of the talk. I'm really pleased to be able to uh, come and speak to you on this topic. It's part of a project that I'm working on at the moment. I've got one article coming out um, in relation to some of the work that's within it, but a lot of the other work specifically on welfare is ongoing. So it would be really great to have uh, your comments and questions to push me to think about these issues further. So the title is The Colonial Context of National Welfare from Imperial Amnesia to White Replacement. In the middle of the coronavirus pandemic and the global resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movements, over recent months we've seen the toppling of statues, the removal of statues, and local councils across the country promising a review of how history is to be publicly represented. Now these events haven't happened without the significant backlash also occurring. And so there have been any number of commentators warning against the erasure of history. Indeed, our own Prime Minister, in response to these events, has said, and I quote, we cannot now try to edit or censor our past. We cannot pretend to have a different history. However, what I want to set out during this talk is that instead of erasing history through the removal of statues, and particularly here thinking about Colston's statue in Bristol, more people are perhaps more aware of that history and the way in which that history continues to configure the present. So it seems that what those are objecting to is really the address and highlighting of omissions within our historical understandings, rather than the removal of statues in their own terms. And why that might be so, I would suggest, is because to the extent that their own sense of self is intimately tied to the idea of empire having been a force for good in the world, they're profoundly unsettled by arguments that get made to the contrary. So in this context, what I find surprising is how they locate such criticisms as forms of identity politics, when it's quite clear, at least to me, that the only politics of identity being peddled here is their own. For example, in the Prime Minister's own book about Winston Churchill, there is not one mention of the famine in Bengal in 1943, in which over 3 million people lost their lives and which was a direct consequence of policies enacted by the British government. So the erasures and omissions of history which structure our common sense understandings are what are highlighted by the toppling of statues and calls for their removal. In the talk today, what I try and do is focus on some of these omissions and erasures. And I take issue with claims about white replacement and questions about who is legitimately entitled to a share in the wealth of European nations. 
And what I'm interested in is the way in which these particular terms have come to be a major part of political debate across Europe and how they're reinforced by the histories that we narrate in public life and in our academic institutions and how they're shaped by the histories that we leave out of these tellings. So across the political spectrum, scholars have been presenting arguments about the demise of the welfare state and the rise of neoliberalism. And they suggest that these factors ought to be understood as a consequence of racialized migration or the rise of a politics of recognition, which they suggest have contributed to the breakdown of the national and class solidarities that they believe are otherwise necessary to the maintenance of social democracy. Brexit is one key political event that highlights these debates and the misunderstandings that such debates are predicated on. Primarily, or the key misunderstanding I would suggest is the idea that Britain has been a nation and that national assets have been built up endogenously to be passed on as an inheritance to future citizens. The fundamental assumption in such claims is that the national patrimony available for distribution is precisely that that it's national. That is, it is wealth that has been generated through the activities of national citizens over time and whose use and distribution ought to be regulated for the people properly understood whose contributions and efforts it represents. Not for, or it should not be used for, to use Wolfgang Strake's terms, invaders. That is, those he considers outsiders. In a similar vein, the left-wing economist Branko Milanovic argues for the necessity of protecting the citizenship premium of nationals against the inward movement of migrants from poorer parts of the world. This is because he states that rich countries accumulate wealth and transmit it along with many other advantages to the next generation of their citizens. We take it as normal, he states, that there is a transmission of collectively acquired wealth over generations within the same nation and for the enjoyment of its national citizens. Such sentiments are not new and they are also a part of the tradition of left thinking in the UK. In their classic re-study from 2006, The New East End, Jeff Dench, Kate Gavron and Michael Young, for example, argued that hostility against those they call newcomers, that is, for the most part, darker British citizens, was understandable because, and I quote, their families cannot have put much into the system, so they should not be expecting yet to take so much out. They go on to state that the metropolitan working class had been struggling for generations to share in the nation's wealth, and that this was now being made available too easily by the British Nationality Act of 1948 to the world's poor, that is to indigent outsiders. So the justification of resentment about newcomers or outsiders having access to the British welfare state is made by these authors, despite acknowledging, and I quote, that all classes within the metropolitan nation had profited together from empire. So, all classes within the nation had profited from empire, but those from empire who were now within the nation had no right to expect equality of access to the rights and benefits of the imperial state. The question of those within empire beyond the nation was not even raised. This, I suggest, is a political problem, but it is also a scholarly one. The failure of social scientists to understand that Britain was an empire rather than simply having an empire, is central to what I have called the methodological whiteness at the heart of our disciplines and our generalized understandings. In the talk today, I address these broader issues through a discussion of the standard history of capitalism that is presented as leading to the high point of the welfare state in Britain specifically. A history that for the most part fails to regard the significance of colonialism except as part of its prehistory. In contrast, I seek to present a reconstructive understanding of capitalism that's inclusive of colonialism and that sees colonialism as constitutive of capitalism. This reconstruction would open up the space to understand what is presented as the patrimony of European societies to be properly understood as the appropriation of the resources of colonized others 
to the benefit of national populations in Europe, and this is legitimized through the erasure of imperial histories from our standard narratives. There is something truly puzzling about European scholars' failure to address colonialism as constitutive of their societies and as constitutive of every aspect of their possibilities of being. Perhaps the explanation for this omission rests in the fact that colonialism led to the betterment of European societies directly at the expense of the lives, livelihoods and environments of others. And people don't really wish to reckon with what the consequences of a proper accounting would open up. Not even, it seems, on the left. In contrast, I argue that a properly critical analysis would offer us the possibility of a better understanding of our shared past so that we could more appropriately construct a world in which all of us could live well. But first to the standard account and its reconstruction. So I'm using the work here of uh, Nancy Fraser and Rahel Yegi, who, when discussing the history of capitalism, suggests that there are four quite familiar stages that most historians of capitalism would accept. First, you have mercantile or commercial capitalism. This is followed by so-called liberal competitive capitalism and then state managed or social democratic capitalism, namely the welfare state. And then finally, financialized capitalism. And the latter stage can also be thought of as the conversion of public assets into private property, something that we're seeing apace at the moment. The first stage of mercantile capitalism is presented as occurring from the 16th to the 18th century, when, as Fraser suggests, neither land nor labor was a true commodity. She goes on to argue that during this period, absolutist rulers regulated commerce internally within their territories, even as they profited from external plunder and long distance trade, which were organized capitalistically through an expanding world market in luxury commodities. Why this should be understood as capitalist, as opposed to as colonial, is not made clear, particularly as the trade in luxury commodities, which is presented as the most significant aspect of mercantile capitalism, would not have been possible without the elimination of indigenous peoples in Abiyala, what we now call the Americas, and appropriation of their lands and the extraction of silver and other resources from them. This was also the period that saw the beginnings of the systematic trade in human beings that would enslave millions of Africans and transport them as commodities to the new world. They were then coerced to work in the extractive industries that mined the resources in Abiyala, which were then used to trade with India and China for those luxury commodities. This was before being coerced to work on plantations to produce sugar, tobacco and cotton for European markets. To suggest, as Fraser does, that neither land nor labour was a true commodity at this time, and to fail to take seriously the colonial processes that underpin the possibilities of what is regarded as mercantile capitalism is a serious historical misunderstanding. It is one which reifies a mode of capitalism abstracted from its conditions in colonialism. More importantly, it fails to recognize the constitutive nature of the appropriation and commodification of land and labor and of laborers to the development of capitalism. So this first stage of capitalism, I would suggest, is better understood simply as colonialism through private property. It's succeeded by colonialism as national project, whereby European states begin the process of seeking to domesticate the external activities of private companies through the establishment of direct imperial rule. What constitutes internal or external in an area of state managed colonialism, however, is also what is at issue here. The core European states, for example, are understood as having a theoretical and conceptual integrity as nation states. And what happens beyond their borders is not regarded as integral to understanding their domestic activities. This, however, rests on a misunderstanding of these states being nations and having empires, instead of more properly understanding them as being imperial states. To understand them as imperial states would be to bring within a common frame of analysis events and processes that are otherwise incorrectly disaggregated. <laughs> 
It would be to recognize the colonial processes upon which imperialism depended and through which capitalism develops. So th this uh, reconfiguration of the different stages of capitalism is something that I do much more extensively in uh, a paper that's forthcoming. Here I'm presenting it quite uh, briefly, but obviously I'd be happy to respond to questions about this uh, reconceptualization of the stages. So this sense of sort of moving from the first stage to the second stage, and the second stage is what I would sort of see as um, capitalism emerging through this process of being regarded as a national project. That is where it becomes something that is explicitly taken on by states. And I'll discuss that in the context of the British involvement in India. So the British start trading with India in the early 1600s. The East India Company gets its Royal Charter in 1600. And for the first sort of century and a half, it's involved effectively in trade and trade which ultimately becomes a, a form of plunder uh, very quickly. So you can see William Dalrymple's recent book, which highlights this um, uh, incredibly well but also it'd been known from much earlier. Thomas Macaulay writes on, on this uh, extensively in the mid 19th century as well. And what happens is that in the mid 18th century, in 1857 particularly, there's a battle between the East India Company, which is fighting French colonists in India and local Indian rulers. And the British government provide military assistance to the English East India Company, which then wins at the Battle of Plassey, and it turns the company from being simply concerned with trade to governing Bengal with tax collecting powers. This process transformed the private pillage that was being carried out by company men into what was to become the state organized systematic drain of resources. That is, it was pillage on an industrial scale. This was done through pocketing of profits from enforced monopolies, extraction of resources, transfer of treasure, interest on enforced loans, loss by exchange, and perhaps most perniciously, direct and indirect taxation upon the increasingly impoverished population. Now, if I can just sort of uh, say here, I mean, one of the things that the East India Company does is take over tax collecting powers from the local Maharaja. And it's not as if uh, taxes hadn't existed previously, that the, the previous Maharajas had organized systems of taxation within their, uh, the areas of their rule. When they collected tax, they would often save some of that tax in order to be able to support the population to whom they had a sense of responsibility, should there be events that may lead to famines and, and so on. So in the context of crop failure, what the East India Company does when it takes over taxation is to take the entirety of the money that it raises in taxation to England. So none of it remains in India as something that could be drawn upon to deal with things like uh, uh, crop failures. In the 1770s, so very quick, so very early on in the period of the East India Company having taken over tax raising powers, there is a crop failure. It's not a crop failure that's particularly worse than previous ones that, that had occurred in the region, but it is one that leads to death. And scholars of famine often distinguish between famines that produce hunger and famines that produce death. Now, whilst there had been famines that produced hunger under the Mughal emperors and others, it's under the East India Company and British rule that you have the, um, you have exceeding numbers of famines that are producing death and death at quite an extraordinary scale. So in the 1770s, the famine that is produced as a consequence of the East India Company's practices in relation to taxation and its failure to provide any sort of relief is that one in three of the population die of starvation. So out of a population of 30 million, 10 million, die because the East India Company had forced all farmers uh, to sell their reserves because to keep a grain reserve was uh, 
uh, to take away from the profit that they could gain and, and so on. So there were no grain reserves and they also refused to provide any, any relief. And they also failed to allow any sort of mitigation of the taxes. So within that area of Bengal or under East India Company rule, the taxes were, um, the village was obliged collectively to pay a tax. So as people were dying of starvation, those who survived had to pay the taxes of those who had died. And so when a report was eventually commissioned on this process, and it was done by um, Warren Hastings, who was to become the next governor general of Bengal, he expressed astonishment that uh, in the period of famine, and remember one third of the population has died, the amount of taxation collected by the East India Company actually increased. So, while the extent of colonial drain across the period of British rule from India is contested, it's largely accepted that there was a significant transfer of wealth from India to Britain over the period of colonial rule. And I'm going to give you some figures here and I'm going to use the work of Angus Madison, who is believed to provide much more conservative estimates than say compared to the work of people like Dada Bhai Naroji or R.C. Dutt. Um, but you'll see that the figures that I'm presenting to you, even though they're conservative, are really still quite extraordinary. So during the period of rule by the East India Company, that is from 1757 till 1947, official transfers from India to the UK rose over time until they reached about 3.5 million in 1856. So 3.5 million in 1856 would be about 350 million in today's money. And so this is the amount of money that was being transferred through official routes from India to Britain. And it's sort of, you know, it, it was done through processes of uh, taxes, but also the, the taking of resources, the establishment of tea plantations over time and the, the profits that would come from that. And once the East India Company took over tax raising powers, it was able to use the taxes that it collected in Bengal to then buy the goods from those who were producing them in Bengal. And so this creates a double sort of drain that people like Utsapat Naik have, have talked about quite extensively. As historian John Richards states, East India Company profits over this period would soar to undreamed heights. And the revenue that was collected was used to conquer and annex territory beyond Bengal and across the Indian subcontinent, including into Afghanistan and Burma by the early 19th century. Obviously, as additional territory was annexed, that territory also brought with it populations and populations that could be taxed, which then produced additional revenue, and so it went on. Now, the official transfers from India to Britain didn't include private remittances. This is the amount of money that individual East India Company men uh, took uh, to, to Britain. And Dada Bhai Naroji has estimated the private remittances to be uh, around 10 million pounds a year in the 1880s. In today's money, that would be about a billion pounds a year. So, on top of this, East India Company officials and European military officers not only received exceedingly high salaries, which included a compensation payment for having to work in India and to provide for their families back in Britain, but these salaries were hardly taxed and their own pensions were funded out of taxes that were taken from the Indian population. Even the salaries of the employees of the India office in London were paid out of Indian revenues and were exempt from income tax. So the Secretary of State, for example, received £5,000 a year from Indian revenues and paid nothing in income tax, whilst a petty trader would have a, 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 an income of around £60 and would pay uh, 20 rupees as income tax out of that. So official salaries constituted about 10% of expenditure and now I'm sure you've all heard about the railways and what a wonderful thing the railways were that the British uh, established in India, just to, you know, so if the official salaries were 10% of expenditure, the amount that was spent on public works, including railways, rarely exceeded 2% of total outlays. After 
um, the Indian Mutiny in 1857, the British state decides to take over direct rule. So from 1858 to 1947, you have direct rule from Britain. And in that century, Madison suggests that the official transfer of funds, which are now known as home charges, were by the 1930s in the range of 40 to 50 million pounds a year. That would be the equivalent of 2.5 billion to 3.2 billion annually is being taken from India and put into the British state. Now, the issue of taxation. So as I said, you know, this money came out of taxes, out of um, interest on loans, profit, income, and, and the failure to pay income tax. So the tea plantations that existed in India paid their income tax to the government in Westminster, not to the government in New Delhi. So there were lots of ways in which money was, was being taken. The issue of taxation, as I mentioned earlier, is the most pernicious. And this was because, as George Wingate wrote in 1859, and I'm giving you a quote here now, the taxes spent in the country from which they are raised are totally different in their effects from taxes raised in one country and spent in another. So when you're taxed in your own country, the taxes that are collected from you are returned to you in particular sorts of ways. So if you think about the National Health Service or even things like roads and railways and all these sorts of things which are funded out of the taxes that we pay. If you're being taxed and the entire amount of your tax has actually been taken to another country, then they constitute an absolute loss and extinction of the amount that is being taxed. And so what George Wingate says, such is the nature of the tribute we have so long exacted from India. From this explanation, some faint conception may be formed of the cruel crushing effect of the tribute upon, upon it. Now, it's not just India that Britain has as part of its empire. Richard Temple, when he presented the general statistics of the British Empire to the Royal Statistical Society meeting in 1884, determined that the British state had at its disposal 203 million pounds. That was the amount of money that came in uh, for general government to the British state. Out of that 203 million, 89 million came from UK, 74 million came from India, and 40 million came from the rest of the British territories within empire. Now, this wasn't money that was then used for governing other parts of empire. There were additional taxes that were raised in those places in order to provide governance there. This was money that was coming in directly to Westminster for Westminster to do with what it wished. So you can see that there's quite a significant amount of what Utsa Patnaik has called a uh, colonial drain, or rather the other Bainaroji writes about this in 1901. And then uh, over time, scholars continue to work with that concept. And in a recent uh, article that Utsa Patnaik wrote, which draws on two centuries of data on tax and trade, she calculated that over that from the period of the Battle of Plassey in 1757 to the outbreak of the Second World War in the mid 20th century, Britain had taken a total of around $45 trillion from India. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear a million, a billion, a trillion, I'm never quite clear how big these numbers are. I mean, I know they're big, but what the difference between a million, a billion and a trillion is is not clear. So I'm going to give you an example to try and illustrate this because I think it's actually quite extraordinary the scale of difference between these figures. And remember that Britain has taken 45 trillion from India. So if you were given $1 a second in an hour, in a minute you would get $60. In an hour you would get $3,600. It would take a million seconds to get a million. And a million seconds is about 11 and a half days. To acquire a billion would take you 31.7 years. So the difference between a million and a billion is the difference between 11 and a half days and 31.7 years. To acquire a trillion 
at the rate, at the same rate of $1 a second, would take you 31,700 years. That is 317 centuries. And Britain drained a total of 45 trillion from India in two centuries. So here what I've tried to do is by way of illustration, mostly incomplete, is to present the tribute, the taxation and the remittances that Britain extracted from India. And it also had a number of other colonies and dependencies from which it also extracted income and resources. And what was true of Britain was also true of other European powers, albeit in different sorts of ways. So how does this relate to the welfare state and the arguments that I was presenting at the outset? Well, the provision of welfare in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries occurred through a mixed economy of limited state interventions, supplemented by the work of voluntary organizations and private charitable activity. From the poor laws of the 16th century to the welfare state in the mid 20th, one of the key issues for the government was how welfare was to be financed. There was a careful balance of taxation nationally, such that no class or interest group was unduly burdened. And this, as Martin Daunton argues, legitimated the British state internally and ensured the compliance of its national population. It wasn't until the early 20th century and the shared experience of total war that politicians began to consider and then agree to the extensive deployment of the resources of the nation for collective purposes, eventually leading to the establishment of the welfare state. As Michael Mann has argued, building on the work of Richard Titmus, warfare and welfare came together in the idea of the nation as an aggregate of citizens. This was reinforced through the distribution and redistribution of resources within national boundaries. So in brief, a national frame came into being in determining the population to whom recompense was to be made in the aftermath of two devastating wars and a growing national electorate able to lobby for such demands. The shared experience of these wars by imperial subjects in terms both of military service and the provision of resources has rarely been considered. Man, for example, fails to recognize the solidarity of Indians and other imperial subjects with the British state, either in terms of acknowledging their membership within the state or in terms of their claim upon its organization of the resources at its disposal to distribute. His is not a singular failure. It's typical. In the context of the welfare state being seen to be a national project for the amelioration of capitalism, it is rarely asked about what is distributed. Where was the surplus generated that is redistributed? Or if it is asked, as in the case of some Marxist scholars, the answer is given in terms of class relations, again, understood in national terms. So the welfare state then tends to be understood in terms of the nationalization of the state with little reflection back on the existing imperial nature of the state and its finances that were being nationalized. In the immediate aftermath of the First World War, for example, there were a number of debates around the feasibility of setting up a system of national welfare to be funded through taxation. Arthur Bowley, in his study, The Division of the Product of Industry, sought to ascertain the amount of money that could be taken from the rich and added to the wages of the poor such that it would both alleviate poverty and not be an undue burden on the rich. In making his calculations, Bowley determined the national income, which was made up of the total income of people within the UK, as well as income received from abroad. He deducted the amount that would be necessary for running the government and then divided the remainder by the population of the UK. Now, the income derived from abroad primarily referred to the interest paid on loans made by British capitalists to other countries, but it would invariably also have included the taxes and tributes of Indians and other colonized subjects. So just to underline, arguments about providing welfare for the poor within Britain took the taxes of Indians and other colonized subjects into account when making their calculations about its feasibility 
without ever taking them into account as the recipients of the distribution of that fund. It goes without saying that their taxes, tributes and remittances were then also used to fund such schemes as they came into being, as they had been used to fund the infrastructure of the state over the previous two centuries. To return to man's argument about welfare and warfare, we also need to understand that warfare was not an exogenous factor to the political systems involved. It was the basis for increased extraction from the colonies at the same time as welfare began the process of creating social democratic national institutions distinct from empire, although funded significantly by it through direct and indirect means. It is precisely the taxation of and the extraction of resources from colonial dependencies that is the explanation or a large part of the explanation for the growth of the resources available for the establishment of the domestic welfare state. As such, the state is only able to respond to local working class demands by drawing on resources from elsewhere and at the same time excluding those colonized others from the distribution of resources. It is the continued misguided presentation of Britain being a nation having an empire that enables scholars systematically to exclude from their considerations populations beyond the national frame, but who are nonetheless part of the imperial polity. So to wrap up, in the talk, what I've tried to do is set out the ways in which colonialism is constitutive of the emergence and development of capitalism and its political institutions, namely the welfare state. In discussing the history of capitalism, I have sought to challenge the familiar stages that most scholars of capitalism accept and to offer an alternative conceptualization that recognizes colonialism as integral to its development and central to the welfare state. This for me is what decolonizing the curriculum actually means to address the inadequate histories that shape the narratives that we are told and to reconfigure them on the basis of more adequate understandings. The purpose of this is to move beyond Euro-centered explanations that fail to acknowledge the significance of forms of colonial appropriation and displacement to the global inequalities that configure our world. In these terms, the welfare state was not a historic achievement of a domestic working class. It was the amelioration of national conditions of deprivation funded by the labor and resources of colonized subjects who were further immiserated in the process. With the demise of empire in the late 20th century, it's no surprise that the welfare state is itself in question. Whilst decolonization involved no reparation for the previous colonial drain, it did reduce the flow of wealth with consequences for welfare state finances and the fiscal crisis they enter even if that relationship between decolonization and the fiscal crisis of the welfare state is largely unrecognized. Acknowledging the colonial and imperial context of what is presented as our national patrimony could facilitate the generation of more extensive solidarities and a post-colonial reparative and redistributive politics that would be to the benefit of us all. But that's often the sticking point, isn't it? Not all of us, want all of us to benefit. And so what this would involve would be a clear rejection of the nationalistic constructions of undeserving others in order to facilitate new understandings of the meaning of global redistributive justice. It requires, in short, post-colonial reparative action, epistemological and material. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gurminda. So I think we can give you a clap for that. That was a uh, very, very interesting and um, very, very well systematically um, presented. Thank you. I certainly learned a lot from that, and uh, I have a you know number of questions and so on. But I see some people are putting their hands up. So why don't we start with them? So the